Okay, uh, welcome to the CRISP speaker series on privacy, 2014 edition. This is our first talk of uh, the year. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Rob Johnson from Stony Brook University. Rob is the director of the SPLAT lab at Stony Brook, and so we're the CRISP lab and uh, onomatopoeia kind of lab stuff going on there. Um, Rob uh, got his PhD from uh, UC Berkeley, and in fact, I met Rob about uh, a decade ago after we had co-authored a paper together, which is interesting. <laughs> um, and Rob will be talking about uh, website fingerprinting attacks and defenses. So let's welcome Rob. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It was a pleasure working on that paper. I, we should do another one sometime. <laughs> Um, so I want to acknowledge, first of all, the students who worked on this. Uh, my PhD students, Sean Tsai and Rishabh Nithyanand, and a couple of undergrads, Rajesh and Xin Cheng. Um, on the internet today, there's kind of a battle going on between people who want to surf the web privately and people who want to monitor what other users are doing on the web. And sometimes, the attackers are nation states, for example, Iran or Egypt or China or Syria tries to monitor what their citizens do online. Um, and so this, there's a particular technology called Tor, which was originally just designed to, um, for many things, but one of their main goals was to hide what you were doing from uh, outside observers, including, for example, your ISP. And so that has become a popular tool for getting around this circumvention, uh, these, these censorship systems. And it's kind of a, a, a war of escalation that's going on right now. And I want to talk specifically about the attack scenario that we consider in this research. Um, in this scenario, there's a client who is using an encrypting tunnel to some server. And they use that tunnel to talk to different websites on the internet. And uh, the attacker is able to observe the client's connection to the tunnel. Now, you may, if you know Tor, you may be thinking, oh, hey, wait, Tor has got these multi-step circuits. But for the purposes of this attack, it doesn't really matter. There's just a proxy that's going to uh, go and fetch the websites uh, for the, on behalf of the user and then send the contents back over an encrypted channel. And the attacker gets to observe the link between the end user and the first step of that proxy or uh, however it's implemented. But the channel is encrypted. And so these attacks are traffic analysis attacks. The attacker is assumed to be unable to read the content that is being transmitted. And what they have to do is try to infer what the user is doing based on the pattern of the communication. Now, let me quickly summarize the main contributions I want to describe today. One is that I'm going to tell you about a, a relatively new fingerprinting attack that we developed at Stony Brook, and which has actually since been improved and extended by Ian and Tao here. Um, and at the time, it was the state-of-the-art fingerprinting attack, and it broke every defense that we threw at it. I, I also want to describe uh, a website fingerprinting attack there's a bit of a terminology confusion. In, in the broad literature, these are all called website fingerprinting attacks. We try to make a distinction between a, an attack that recognizes a single page versus an attack that recognizes you are on this site traversing pages on this site. So it's like a multi-step attack. Um, and so this is a little bit more of a realistic attack scenario. And we have some ongoing work, which I'll give you a preview of, to get some theoretical performance bounds on if you want this level of security, what's the minimum bandwidth or latency cost that you're going to have to pay in order to hide what you're doing from this kind of an attacker. And some first steps at trying to develop some efficient and secure defenses. So if there was just one or two messages you were gonna take away from this talk, one is that all the defenses that are out there that were uh, proposed at the time that we did this research are broken. There've been a couple since then that have that might be secure. Um, and I hope I'll convince you that there's room here for the development of some theoretical foundations. Because one of the questions 
that's really hard to answer in this, in this area is how do you define good enough security? And the overall outline of the talk will be that I'll describe our attack, and I'll describe some of the old defenses that it can beat, and then I'll show you the experimental results of this attack against these defenses. And then I'll tell you about the website fingerprinting attack, uh, a defense that was published around the same time that these attacks were published, and our initial follow-on work. And then once I show you the follow-on work, there's going to be an immediate question that will come up, which is how do we compare different uh, defenses which have different levels of security and different uh, costs. And so I'm going to try to develop a little bit of theoretical stuff to help us compare them. So just to go back, the main steps of a fingerprinting attack is that the attacker will collect a database of fingerprints for different websites, and then he will observe the, the victim's actual traffic and then try to match the victim's traffic to entries in his database. Uh, so, you know, the first step, the attacker can use the same uh, proxy system that the victim would use. So if the victim can use Tor, the, the attacker can use Tor as well. And then the, the attacker can collect these fingerprints. Then later on during the attack, the attacker observes the actual victim's fingerprint and matches it against the database. So the big question is, what is a good fingerprint, and how do we tell what is a match in a fingerprint, or between fingerprints? So we did something quite simple. Um, we take, as a fingerprint, this, one of the first things you might think of, which is to record the packet trace that the victim transmits, and then just construct a string of numbers which indicate the size and direction of the packets in order. So what this indicates is that um, the first packet was a 1200 byte packet and it was traveling, say, upstream, maybe it was a request, then the next packet was a 1500 byte packet coming downstream, then there was another one, then there was a 1000 byte upstream packet, and so on. The actual inter-packet timings we just throw away in this attack. And then we use an algorithm called optimal sequence alignment, um, which at the time we thought was called the Damero Levenstein edit distance, but we realized it was not, that was the wrong name for it, um, to compare, to decide whether two traces are close together or not. And we build a, cl a classifier using support vector machines from this. Let me give you a little bit of intuition for why an edit distance based comparison function is a good one for this application. Um, so if you maybe forgotten, but edit distance is a, a distance function on strings, and it roughly takes, it, tell, it tells you how many operations do you need to perform to transform the first string into the second string. So in this example, uh, these, these strings are pretty similar, so if you just delete that A, then X becomes this middle string, and then if you transpose these Bs and that B and C, then it becomes Y. So their edit distance is two, or it's at most two, and I'm pretty sure it's not any less than two. Um, and the edit distance that we are using has uh, three operations, which you can delete symbols, you can insert symbols, uh, I guess there's substitutions, but that's not too important, and then transpositions. And our hypothesis was that these string operations kind of fit naturally with what happens on a real network when you're loading a page. For example, a deletion might correspond to a packet drop, and then an insertion might be the retransmission later. Um, if two packets arrive out of order, that might be a transposition. Um, you could also have, although I forgot to listen on the slides, substitutions, which might mean that in one version of the page, there's a large image, so there's a packet of one size, and another version of the page, the image is slightly different, maybe it's a little bit smaller, and so you get a packet of a different size. And in fact, that can also be handled by these deletes and inserts. If it's a significantly larger image in the page, then you'll have extra packets to carry the extra information. Let me show you how this plays out with real websites. Um, here are 
two different versions of the New York Times homepage loaded. Um, I don't remember if these are on different days or just different times of day. And as you can see, the overall structure is more or less the same, but the actual images, the little icons and things have changed from one version to another. But if you actually observe the sequence of transactions that the browser performs when loading these pages, it's pretty much the same both times. The browser first requests the index.html, then it parses index.html and sees that there's a banner image at the top, so it requests that page, then you know, it gets the image for the top story, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes through the same sequence of operations. And if you actually look at the, uh, the trace of the packet sizes, you see a lot of similarity between these two pages. And um, this is, these are the actual traces for these two pages here. Um, and you can see they, they just visually look pretty similar. But if you go and investigate, you'll see that there's an initial request for the index page, then you see requests for some JavaScript, and then you see requests for ads, and so on. On the other hand, if you look at a different news site, CNN, already right away, uh, visually it looks a little bit different. And that's just got a different, a different structure to the page, and so the pattern of requests and responses don't match up. By the way, feel free to ask questions at any time. So now that we have a distance function that seems to make sense, um, we need to build a classifier. And one natural classifier is a nearest neighbor classifier, which we tried out. It didn't work so well. Um, so in cons consultation with some machine learning experts, we built a support vector machine classifier. But support vector machines don't operate on distance functions. They operate on kernel functions. And a kernel function is essentially a function that tells you the angle between vectors. And these strings of numbers are not vectors. And so you, it's not straightforward how you would define an angle between two strings of characters. But there is a nice conversion from a distance function to a kernel function by taking basically e to the minus l, where l is the uh, distance function uh, squared. Um, we also found that there was another um, optimization that improved performance, which was to normalize the distance based on the length of the strings. And you have to normalize based on length somehow, because to a very big website, even if you look at two different traces of the same website, just the absolute, different, the absolute magnitude of the difference between those two traces will be larger than two traces of a small website. There's simply more places in which it can differ. So you have to normalize by the size of the website. And it turns out normalizing by the min makes a lot of sense here because if you normalize by the max, well, let's think about it. If the two websites are the same size, then it doesn't matter whether you do min or max, really. But if they're very different sizes, then they're probably not the same website. And so you want the distance to be large. And so dividing by the smaller of them will result in a large difference. All right, that's, that's it. That is the DLSVM attack. That's how it works. Now let me show you some of the defenses that have, people have proposed uh, in the past. These all predate the DLSVM attack. So these were the metrics that we were going we're, we're, that we're going to use to measure how good this attack, how well this attack works. So most defenses focus on packet level features. Um, and mostly sizes. So a lot of defenses that have been proposed were about padding packets out so they all had the same size or some other you know, scheme like that. There's another one called morphing I'll describe to you briefly. There's a few defenses that operated at the HTTP level. Um, they, they tweaked the sequence of request and response from the browser to, um, to try to hide what website you were visiting. And I'll describe those to you as well. So packet padding is very popular because it's very easy to come up with your own packet padding scheme. You could, you could pad packets to a random size or by a random amount. You could pad all packets to the MTU, pad them to a power of two. There's this thing called mice elephants where you either pad them to 128 bytes or to 1500 bytes. Tor uh, packs data into 512 byte cells. Lots and lots of different padding schemes. As you'll see in, this eva in the evaluation, it doesn't matter, they're all no good. 
Traffic morphing is similar to padding, but it has a slightly more aggressive goal. In traffic morphing, you want to take as input a sequence of packets, and that's going to have some distribution of sizes. And then you want to transform that sequence into an output sequence that has a different distribution. So you'll have a specific target distribution of packet sizes. And it's rather obvious what you're going to have to do. If you receive, you, you'll, you'll sample from the output distribution. And then if you have a large packet, but the packet size you sampled for your output is small, then you'll have to break up the incoming packet and, and produce a small packet. If your incoming packet is a small packet, but you sample a large packet size, then you're going to have to pad it out with junk. And so here's an example where you know, maybe there was an incoming packet of 1,400 bytes, and the first sample you drew from your output distribution was 1,000 bytes. So you take the first 1,000 bytes of this 1,400-byte packet and you send it. And then you draw another sample from your output distribution. Maybe your next sample is 512 bytes. Well, you've only got 400 bytes of input left, so you just pad that out. Uh, this was, there's, there's a paper at NDSS that describes this. It actually describes also a, a clever trick for making it a little bit more efficient. Um, but I don't think it matters for the security. More recently, there have been some um, HTTP level defenses. Uh, HTTP OS published at NDSS um, did, it was kind of a kitchen sink approach to defending against uh, fingerprinting attacks. So it sends extra bogus HTTP requests when you're loading a page. So if you go visit facebook.com, you know, your browser will generate a bunch of requests. HTTP OS would act as a proxy that would forward those requests, but it would also insert extra requests for random things on the web. And those extra requests were kind of were intended to obscure what you were doing. It would also split requests into multiple overlapping range requests. So for example, if you requested an image, then it would break that request into two requests, say for the first part of the image and then for the second part of the image, but it would actually overlap the request so that there would be a little bit of redundancy. And so that would obscure the size of the image that you were requesting. It would also pipeline these requests uh, so that two different requests might go out in the same packet. And it, could even, it would even open multiple TCP connections and then send one part of, the, of a range request over one connection and then another one over another one. So it's really working hard to scramble the sequence of operations and also to hide the size of the objects that are being fetched from the website. But wait, there's more. In addition to these HTTP uh, level defenses, HTTP OS also does some network level defenses. It munges the maximum segment size and the advertised window sent by the client to the, to the server so that how your TCP streams get packetized will be varied from execution to execution. Lastly, uh, one more uh, recently proposed defense is randomized pipelining. Uh, and this was described on the Tor blog back in 2011 and is now, if I'm not mistaken, enabled by default on the Tor browser, although, okay, thank you. Um, so this is a deployed defense in the wild. Um, and the idea behind this defense is that they, uh, before, before this came along, the way most browsers operated, more or less, is when you visit a web page, they fetch the HTML file for that page, and then they parse that file. Then they begin stepping through all the embedded objects, like images, JavaScript, Flash files, and they start requesting them one at a time in order as they are encountered in the file. Um, it may not be one at a time. They might, uh, I think they, some of them would request up to four different things at once. Um, so there could be a little variation in the order and the way that plays out, but they, they were deterministic as far as how they made these requests. Um, so what randomized pipeline does is you, it does request the original HTML file, that's, a, that's still the same, but then it collect, computes the entire set of objects that it has to fetch, and then it just picks randomly from those and fetches them in a random order. And it also pipelines some of the the, the requests. And so this is pseudocode that was posted on the Tor blog 
for how it would work. It would say, while there are images remaining to be gotten, pick a random integer from 4 to 12, choose a random subset of that many pictures, and then issue requests for all those pictures at once. And since this is implemented in uh, the Tor browser bundle, this defense, the only, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to re-implement ourselves, so when we evaluate it, it's going to be this plus Tor operating together. Okay, so now that we have the, the two sides of this battle, we've got the defenses and we've got this new attack, let's see how it's going to play out. Now, what we, are, what we did to evaluate this attack is called a closed world evaluation. In a closed world evaluation, there are k different websites or web pages that the victim can visit and the victim is assumed to choose one page uniformly at random from that set of k URLs and then visit that page. The attacker gets to observe that trace and then now has to make a guess which of those k sites did the victim uh, choose. Um, now, the data set we used was uh, of the thousand top pages from, as listed by Alexa at the time of this experiment, which is probably about two years ago now. So some of them are still popular, some of them maybe not so much. Um, we had to remove a few broken links that we found and we were left with a little over 800, which we just rounded off to 800 sites. We collected data by visiting each page 20 times. Um, and we did this in a, in a round robin fashion. So you might be concerned if I collect 20 traces of the New York Times, 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 dot, dot, dot. They're going to be very similar traces. The network conditions will be the same. The content of the page won't be changing very much. And so it's kind of an unfair uh, attack. So we did it in a round robin fashion. We get, get one trace from New York Times, one trace from CNN, one trace from Viet, um, Facebook, one trace from Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And then we come back and do it all again. And this is such a slow process that there was, I think, about a half a day. It took two weeks to collect the data overall, so there must have been about a half day between each visit to the same site. Um, and then we repeated the collection process for four different defenses. One is just visiting the websites over an SSH proxy. Uh, one is SSH with the HTTP OS system in place. And then there was plain old Tor at that time, and then Tor with randomized pipelining as it was implemented at that time. Now, once we have these uh, inputs, we can build a classifier. And the way you do sort of the gold standard of evaluating classifiers is to do what's called tenfold cross-validation, which it means um, you take all your traces and from each class, so that's like each website in this case, you take out one-tenth of the traces and you, you use the remaining 90% to train a classifier and then use that classifier to, to train the remaining 10%. I'm sorry, to evaluate the remaining 10%. And you do this 10 times for 10 different subsets of testing data. And then you compute the average success rate. So here are the results. Uh, this is when we have a universe size of k equals 100 websites. Now, if you think about random guessing, which would be the ideal level of security, you would hope that the attacker would have a 1% chance of guessing what website you were visiting if you were using an encrypting proxy. But in fact, what we find is that the attacker has somewhere upwards of 75 to even 90% success rate at guessing which of 100 websites you were visiting. So this was, we were delighted. <laughs> it was a surprising result. Um, and what this means is that depending on what, how much security you want, uh, these defenses are probably, these defenses are probably not going to give it to you. Um, we then wanted to evaluate some network level defenses. And by network level defenses, you know, I mean op defenses that operate on padding out packets and manipulating things just at the network level. So, we wrote a, simulated, a simulation of SSH plus traffic morphing. Essentially, we took the traces we had collected using SSH, 
and then we applied traffic morphing to them. Um, we also took the traces that we had collected using Tor with randomized pipelining, and we added extra random cover traffic up to, in fact, I think the numbers I'm going to report here are up to as much cover traffic as there was original traffic. So if there were 1,000 packets originally, we just stuck in 1,000 extra packets randomly throughout the trace. And uh, we also padded all the packets to 1,500 bytes. So there was no size information available to this attack. And as you can see, the, the attack is still very successful against all these different defenses with uh, network uh, defenses, you know, even added on top of the HTTP defenses. The one where it starts to get pretty difficult is when you have as much cover traffic as you have original traffic. But if you think about that, that's going to have high overhead if you try to use such a system in practice. Yeah? So uh, you remember the uh, difference which was uh, uniformly a random pick a packet size and then split or merge? Uh, I assume that is a norm, which is a number of different choices from which the solution, from which the defense picks uniformly a random way. So your question is about traffic morphing and, and, and yeah, no, that's okay. That's no problem. Um, and you're asking how many different packet sizes could exactly. does is your traffic morphing system allowed to choose from as its output distribution? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I assume it's a, somewhat of a tunable now. I mean, you can kind of sense the trade-offs involved, right? Because yes. I don't want one byte to be a choice because of the overhead. Right? And that's a really good question. Um, the way they described it in the original paper was that traffic morphing could be used to transform, for example, the packet size distribution of facebook.com into the packet size distribution of ESPN.com. And I forget, and, and that's how we did it too, but I don't think it was ESPN. It was some website, and I'm honestly, I'm, I don't remember which one, but it wasn't, it was probably in the top 10. We just probably picked one out of the top 10. And, and computed the, tra the packet size distribution and, and targeted that. Yeah. Um, so just to point out, a lot of the previous attacks that, we, uh, that were published before this one had primarily focused on packet sizes. And kind of one of the goals we had in the back of our head with this research was, what other ways can your trace leak information about what you're doing other than the distribution of packet sizes? And so, these two scenarios, there is no size information being leaked to the attack, and yet it still has a pretty good success rate. And you might be thinking, hey, well, okay, that's with 100 web pages. What about when there's a lot of web pages that the attacker has to guess from? And it, of course, it, the success rate does go down as the number of web pages goes up. So here's. I've been showing you points from right here, the 100 website points. But the success rate degrades pretty smoothly and not too quickly as you go up to, say, 800 websites. These, this, is, by the way, is Tor, specifically. Now, there's a lot of practical issues that you might think about when doing um, fingerprinting attacks. Um, for example, caching. The, it, the way I describe these attacks, the way it's working is that it's looking at the structure of requests and responses that take place between the browser and the server. And so if your browser has a particular image cached, then maybe that would make it harder for you to fingerprint requests for that page because sometimes the image will be in one of the requests and sometimes it won't. Turns out we can handle that. You may also think, well, what about JavaScript dynamically requesting stuff from the server after the page is loaded? Wouldn't that confuse the fingerprinting attack? We can handle that. Um, you might ask, well, what if I uh, always load two different tabs with two different pages at the same time so that your, the attacker will see some interleaving of the requests and responses that are necessary to load these two different pages? Well, we need to do some experiments about that. But I don't think, if you think about what does a user want, in terms of security, you don't want to have to tell your users, be sure you're always loading two tabs at the same time if you want to be secure on the web. You want a system that works for arbitrary user behavior, and sometimes users really do just load one tab at a time. 
So the takeaways from this part of the talk are that um, you know, a lot of these network defenses are broken. Uh, the HTTP defenses are broken. And um, it is that, that your trace of packets that an attacker can observe can leak what you're doing through many different channels, packet size, uh, packet ordering, possibly others we haven't looked at, such as inter-packet timing. And so a good defense should cover all of these. Questions about the basic attack before I switch gears and tell you about the, how we bootstrap this to a, an attack to um, go against the whole website. Yeah? Um, I don't know much about security and all, but uh, one thing which is confusing me is if you're padding it up and uh, if you don't have any size information, then how exactly does your attack means? How exactly do you attack it? How is your attack so successful if you're padding it with? You don't have request and response recognition now. You have, you'll have upstream 1500, downstream 1500 in every damn case. So how exactly does your attack work in there? So that's the key. So, uh, so you're asking, if there's no size information, what is left that you can use to recognize the website? And um, the attacker can still observe the direction of the packets and, and the ordering of the packets. And so, for example, as a very simple example, to give you something concrete to think about, imagine a web page that's just pure text with no images. Then the, the the trace that the attacker observes will be a, re a request, a packet going upstream, and then a bunch of packets going downstream, and then silence. But if the, pa if the image, I'm sorry, if the page has a lot of images, say just even a single image, then the attacker will see the request for the page, some data coming down, then a request for the image, then some data coming down. And so this attack is attempting to classify pages by looking at exactly that kind of pattern. So ordering is also important. Ordering is important. Yeah. No, no, this is a good question. It's pretty fundamental, so I'm glad, I, I'm glad to help people understand that. Um. OK. So we wanted to extend this to an attack on websites. Um, everything I've described so far was an attack on individual pages. If you load this page, we've got a fingerprint for that page, and we say then you're loading that page. But as you know, when you go to a website, you kind of tend to click around from that web page, website. So one example you might think of would be if you're visiting IMDb, and you go to the front page, and then you search for some movie, and then you get the movie result, I'm sorry, search results page, then you click on a movie, then you get the movie's um, main page, and maybe you click on an actor, and so on, and so on. And you're kind of navigating through the site. And so we'd like to see how we can use this longer uh, observation to more, co more confidently identify what website you're visiting. Now, the approach we take is to model the website and the user's behavior on the website as a hidden Markov model. Um, and the at outputs of the model are the traces that the attacker can observe. And then the way we're going to perform the attack is the attacker will construct a model for the site. And given an HMM and an observation, or a sequence of observations, uh, is an algorithm for computing how likely is this sequence of observations to be generated by this particular model. And so if the algorithm says, yeah, this model is really likely to generate this output sequence, then the attacker will conclude, yes, the victim really is probably visiting the website that that model covers. And if the algorithm says, this, this model this, of this website is very unlikely to generate this output observation, then they're probably visiting some other website. So let me do a little review of HMMs. Um, they are stochastic finite state automaton. So you have some number of states, and there's transitions between the states, and each transition gets taken with a certain probability. So if you're in state X, there's a point, there's a 10% probability that you will go to Y in your, I'm sorry, Z in your next state. There's a 90% chance you'll go to Y. And it's history list, so the only, the next place you go only depends on where you are at that moment. And you can just compute the probability of, of, the, of making this sequence of transitions. 
uh, by just multiplying the probabilities together. But hidden Markov models extend this with outputs. So every time a system that is traversing one of these models enters a new state, it generates an output that can be observed by the attacker. And the outputs are also probabilistic. So when the system enters state Z, there's a 70% chance it'll output some observation which we just label observation A. There's a chance it'll output some observation B. And notice that there's not necessarily a clear separation. It's not like Z is the only one that outputs A. You know, well, X never outputs A in this case, but Y could also output A. So just because you see A, you can't, you can't say, oh yeah, I'm definitely in Z. Um, and as they're usually described, the observations, there's a finite output, a finite set of possible observations. And so this path, X, Y, Z, X, if you think about it, the most likely sequence of observations that it would generate would be CBAC. Um, and in, in a hidden Markov model, the attacker gets to see the observations, but the attacker doesn't know what these internal states are that the system was going through. And there is an algorithm called the Ford algorithm that computes, given the model, and an observation, the probability that that model would generate that observation. You don't need to know what the Ford algorithm is. We're just going to use it as a black box. We didn't have to tweak it at all. But let me show you how we cram a web page into this model. So the states of the model that we construct for a site will correspond to the pages on the site. Or for a site such as IMDb, then these states might really correspond to classes of pages. So we're not going to have a, uh, we're not going to have a state for every single distinct movie page. We'll just have a state that says you are looking at a movie page, or you are looking at a search results page, or you're looking at an actor's page. And then these transition probabilities will be somehow derived based on observing real user behavior, which we did not have, so we just made them up. Um, so. Uh, which really only, since we just made them up and they're inaccurate, that means that a, a real attack where you actually measure the probabilities will only do better. Um, and now the observations are, for the attacker, are going to be the traces that get generated when you load a star page or a search page or, a home, or the home page. But there is this problem that the traces, the, the observations that we have are from this sort of infinite space of just packet traces, but in an HMM, the observation is supposed to be just a, um, a, an element of a finite alphabet. So we have to make a connection there. Fortunately, it's easy to, to bootstrap from a closed world attack, like I just described earlier, into um, a classifier that can give you a mapping from packet traces down to a finite set of observations. So what you do is you collect uh, or you define a set of the pages on the site of interest. So I call that set P. So that would be movie pages, star pages, home page, search page. And then you collect a, just a, a random set of other pages that you're going to throw into the mix. So maybe you, you just get a random URLs off of Google somehow, and you add maybe 100 of those to your, to your alphabet. And then you build a classifier in the way that I described earlier, that takes a trace and tells you which one of these it's most likely to be. And so now, when you are observing a packet trace, you're going to use this classifier to convert it to an element of this finite alphabet of possible observations. And furthermore, you can estimate the probability that each page will generate each observation by, after building the classifier, going and visiting this page, say, 100 times and collecting 100 different traces, and running it through your classifier, and seeing what symbols it outputs and with what probabilities. And so now that gives you a probability distribution over your observations for the act of a victim visiting one of these pages. Let me just, let me just it's pretty abstract, so let me show you a concrete example. Here are, uh, 
four different websites. We were building a classifier for, the, for IMDB. We took the, the representative site, the, I'm sorry, the representative page that we used for a movie page was the original Harry Potter movie. Um, and then we just had a bunch of other random sites. I don't even know how my students picked these. These may have been somewhat popular at the time. I don't know what they are. Um, and we would go and visit random movie pages on IMDb, and we'd run them through this classifier and look at how the classifier classified them. And as you can see, we had about 400 samples, and as you can see, something like 96% of the time, the classifier, if you give it a movie page, it says, that's Harry Potter. But sometimes it says it's, damn it all to hell, uh, or battle on, or robot wisdom. But this gives us a probability distribution of what observation we're going to see when, we, when a, the victim visits a movie page. So let me show you how we evaluate this. Um, we built a model for IMDb. Um, it's actually pretty similar. Those numbers may have even been taken from the paper, the transition probabilities, but they are just made up. Um, it, we actually had some extra states. Like there was a version of each page for a warm cache and for a cold cache visit to that page. Um, and we used the Alexa Top 99 as the distractor pages. Uh, to obtain traces of real user behavior, there was another researcher who had been collecting users' web browsing history, and he shared the data with us. And it, those data only included traces of th they vi the user visited this URL at this time, the user visited this URL at this time. It didn't actually include the trace of packets, it was just they went to this page. So we went and collected traces for those pages ourselves. Uh, the users visited IMDB pretty regularly, um, but they also just visited other websites that I don't even know what they were. We never even looked at the other websites in the construction of this attack. Um, the, so, you know, the construction of this attack was not informed by the distribution of websites that they visit, other than to know that they did visit IMDb some of the time. Um, we tried to build another version of this attack for Facebook, but it turns out all the users were European, and they never visited Facebook. Um, and to define the task here, um, the attacker, we, we were looking at sequences of six page loads in a six consecutive page loads. Um, and we only asked the classifier to classify sequences that were either all IMDB pages or all non-IMDB pages. You could imagine that if a user is browsing the web and then goes from Facebook to IMDB, there's gonna be a, a time when you have a window of six page loads that are half IMDB and half are not. And so now the metric is false positive versus false negative. So the output of the forward algorithm is um, what's called a log likelihood of, well, how likely was that observation given this model? And so um, it's, we take lo the negative log, so a lower score means it's more likely. And a high score means that that trace is not very likely to be generated by this model. And so you can see the blue bars are all IMDb pages and the red bars are the non-IMDB pages. And so if you set a threshold right here, you could achieve a false positive rate of 7.9% and a false negative rate of 5.6%. And if you were willing to look at longer and longer windows, you could get that even higher. So here's an example just to show you um, how you can use this to even pinpoint when a user is visiting IMDb or whatever page of interest you want. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, hard to explain how the graph works, but there's this horizontal line. And whenever there's a pink dot on the line, that was when the user was visiting IMDb. And whenever there's no pink dot on that black line, that's when the user was visiting something else. And for each consecutive of six page loads, we compute the log likelihood that that set of page loads was from IMDb. And as you can see, here the user was spending a lot of time on IMDb, uh, not getting any work done, and the log likelihood is always pretty low. In fact, that horizontal line is drawn at the optimal cutoff between saying they're at IMDb versus not IMDb. 
So when this blue line is below the horizontal line, that means our algorithm would say they're visiting IMDb at this time. And if you look at it, you see when there's no pink, the blue line is above the cutoff. And when there's a lot of pink, the blue line is below the cutoff. So it's, it's telling you how much that they're visiting IMDb, and it can even tell you they're visiting it right now. OK, again, there's a lot of practical issues. Uh, caching, JavaScript, forward, back buttons that users might use. We can handle all those things in our model. Uh, again, I would say if you're, there's a multiple tab objection, but we do want defenses to work even when users use multiple tabs. Yes? Let's go back to the picture. So, how, so if you set the value of 6 to 1, then you're just using your old yes. algorithm. Yes. And with 6, it's this picture. So if you, how does this vary with the value of 6? Particularly with 1, how would your algorithm have done? The I don't have that. Mutation and I just did your straight class page classifier. I don't have that data. Um, but that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Could I ask a quick follow-up to that? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so you, you made up the transition probabilities. Yeah. Um, did you try them with uniform transition probabilities? So the question, so your question is, um, did we try, we made up the transition probabilities, did we try uniform transition probabilities? No, not uniform, but the made, you know, we didn't want to make a strong bet on any particular transition probability, so they're not, they're, they're, there's not many state that has a very strong bias towards the next state. Right, that's what, if those numbers, were those the numbers, the actual numbers you used by going to the picture? Or? I think they're pretty close, yeah. yeah. So, because there's... We can take this offline, but. If, if your point, if you, the point you're about to make is that essentially what this, if the, if the transition probabilities are uniform, then effectively what we're computing is sort of the, the product of, is, are all these pages uh, matching with some IMDB page? Yep. Yeah, and that's true. But that's, that is still a, a lower bound on what an attack could do. Sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're using the evidence from six traces to, and combining them together in a certain way. If you're doing it with the HMM with some like specified and somehow right transition probabilities, then you're taking advantage of the usual sequencing that you would see. Yes. It might be interesting to see what le what leverage do you get just by considering six traces together, even if you don't. You know what I mean? Even if you're not making any assertion about smoothness or that people once around this page they tend to go to some other page right away or. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just as a baseline, it might be interesting. Yes. Because a lot of times when HMMs are applied to other problems, it turns out that all the power comes from the observation model and not really from the transition model. So. That, that's probably what, that's, that, that is probably the case here, frankly. Um, certainly since our model, our, the transition model was just, we didn't want to make a strong bet that you always go from here to here, so the, the, the transition probabilities are pretty close to uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot more I want to talk about, but I see we're actually already at uh, the, basically the 50 minute mark. Um, so um, I'm going to skip telling you about Buffalo and CS Buffalo. And I just want to briefly, if you'll per <coughs> permit me, tell you about some of the theoretical results. Um, so we wanted to answer a question, um, what is this trade-off between security and uh, overhead. Because if you think about a defense that's operating particularly at a network level, it can't really delete data. It can only add cover traffic. It can pad packets out or add other cover traffic to hide what you're doing. And so the question that we started thinking about was, how much cover traffic do you have to add to get a certain level of security against an attack? And how close do some of the current defenses get to that trade-off? So we, uh, first of all, had to define um, an ideal attacker, and it's, it's not a, the definition may look fancy and complicated, but it's really quite simple. Basically, the attacker is given a trace, and the optimal attacker, if they have perfect knowledge of the distribution of websites that people visit, and the probability that that particular website, when you're using a particular defense, D, generates that particular trace, then they're just going to do uh, argmax, you know, compute the they're going to guess the website that maximizes the probability that it outputs the input trace that they're given. Um, then we can define the level of security of a defense. 
there's two different <coughs> versions of, that you can define. One is called non-uniform and one is called uniform. Um, and what this says is that when you pick a website according to your website choosing distribution and you generate a trace using your defense and you feed that input to the attacker, the probability that they get it right, they guess the right website, is at most epsilon, on average. And so what this means is that websites are on average difficult to identify, but it's an average case thing, so some may be really hard to identify and some may be very easy to identify. There's, uh, the uniform definition says that we take a max of the attacker's success over all the websites and we don't want any website to be easy to identify. And so that's how, that's how we summarize that. Um, I believe this second one may actually be the same as min, uh, sort of a min entropy measurement. Now, let me show you how we can use these ideas to get a relationship between security and bandwidth. But we have to make a lot of simplifying assumptions. Um, Suppose we have a set of websites, and we're going to just suppose that all the websites, every website has a fixed size. Every time you load it, it's the exact same amount of data, every time. And we're also going to assume that a defense is deterministic. This website of this particular size, the defense will always transmit a certain fixed amount of data when you load that website. That looks like the, that's how it should look. <laughs> um, so in this case, if you have an attacker, now, and furthermore, only consider an attacker that just looks at the amount of data you transmit as a victim and wants to make a guess for what web page you're visiting and based on that information alone, then uh, essentially a deterministic defense has to group these web pages together so that it, over, it minimizes the overhead. And uh, for non-uniform security, the, it has to, is a little bit of algebra, you can prove that the number of groups they can use is at most epsilon n, where epsilon is your security parameter. So for example, a good defense might group them like that. And whenever it transmits a page in this group, it's going to transmit the size of the largest page in the group. Well, there's a theorem which says that if you tell me the set of websites and their sizes, and you tell me the level of security that you want, then I can write a dynamic program that will tell you the, tell me the, the optimal way of grouping the websites to minimize the bandwidth overhead. This is assuming the website sizes are deterministic as, are, as is the defense. So we said, okay, let's write that program. Let's take some of the websites that we had collected in the past and let's compute the trade-off curve. This is for a set of 120 websites. This is the security parameter. So a lower number means a, a lower attacker success rate. So this is more secure, that's less secure. This is the bandwidth overhead. So one means no bandwidth overhead. You just transmit exactly the same amount of data as the website. 1.5 means you're transmitting 1.5 times as much data. This is the lower bound you can get for non-uniform security. This is, I'm sorry, uniform security. This is the lower bound you can get for non-uniform security. So it's a start. Unfortunately, the bound is pretty low. Um, and there's a couple of points on here. Um, these are two, the points up there are two different versions of CS Buffalo, which I didn't describe. But this is SSH. This is Tor. So Tor is above the point, the curve at there. It's not clear if it's really close to that curve or not. Um, this is comparing a bunch of different um, versions of Buffalo. Um, which is described in an Oakland paper and a couple other real systems. All these systems were evaluated using non-uniform security in the other papers, so we only plot non-uniform security there. But you can see things, nothing is really getting very close to this curve. So that means we either need to improve the theory to get the curve, to get a better, a tighter lower bound, or there's either, there may be a lot of room for improvement in terms of defenses. I have more, but I'm going to stop there. There's the, the, well, maybe I will say future work. So there is future work. Can we make these bounds better? Um, we have some ideas. Can we use information collected in advance to make a defense more efficient? So all the defenses I've described so far, as you're loading the web page, are just defending you on the fly. They have no idea what 
is going to come into the future. So they, don't, they can't plan ahead. Um, there are several ways you might build a defense using um, prefetching web browsers like Google Chrome, because since they do prefetching, you don't have a lot of this internal structure of request, response, request, response between the client and the proxy. The client just sends a, a request, and the proxy just sends back the entire web page. And so much of that internal structure gets destroyed by these prefetching ser servers. And then, of course, <coughs> we'd like to start figuring out how, what the implications are of these attacks and these defense ideas for circum censorship circumvention. OK, now I'll, I'll call it done. Thank you. Yes. So what was your uh, mindset behind your assertion that improving the theory would raise the, the curve? So, yes. So your question is, perhaps why do I want to raise the curve, or how do I think we might be able to raise the curve? Why, why did you associate improving the theory with raising the curve? I'm just curious. Right. So this curve represents a lower bound on the bandwidth overhead that you have to pay to get this level of security. And there's a huge gap between the practice and the theory. Okay. So the, the lower bound might be too loose. Oh, the lower bound is definitely too loose. Because um, it's only looking at the aggregate size of the page. And there's a lot, of, a lot more information an attacker could try to use to classify a page. So um, the, the, the theorems also need to be extended to randomized defenses and randomized uh, pages. Yeah. Um, would you mind putting up your trace of uh, the HMM one more time? Just kind of say one more HMM thing. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you sort of take Windows sizes of six. Yes. And try your HMM and try your HMM and try, try, sorry, try all of them. Try all of your HMMs and try all of your HMMs and compute probabilities. Yes. So um, one, okay, one of the cases where HMMs are often applied is when you think that you're going to have consistency, you're going to be in the same state from time step to time step, mostly. Okay? Not always, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. So applying an HMM can smooth your predictions over time. It prevents your classifiers from saying wild and crazy things like, I was at IMDb here, and I was at CNN right. here, and then I was back at IDB, and then I was back at CNN, and you see what I mean? Yes. So uh, a natural, if, if, you, if you like the idea of um, just computing the probabilities for each model and then picking your favorite, um, a temporally coherent way of doing that is to use the hierarchical HMM. Uh -huh. The hierarchical HMM have, would have states for every web site. Right. Okay. And then you would get transition probabilities that kind of tell you if you're at IDB, what's the likelihood you're going to stay there, or the likelihood you're going to go back to your work website or something. You know what I mean? Yep. And then those are your <clears throat> second layer of latent states. Uh huh. And then at each time step, you pick an HMM to use uh -huh. for a while. And then when you change state, you're using a different HMM for a while. Um, and it would sort of. Maybe you don't need it, because as I mentioned before, oftentimes it's the observation model that gives the predictive power is not the transition probabilities. Right. But it would be kind of slick to have a hierarchical HMM where you had at the second level of the hierarchy all the websites, and then you can get a posture, like you can get the map estimate of what's the sequence of, of websites that the person was, was visiting in one fell swoop instead of doing this window thing. And then six becomes. I don't know, it's just going to do as many as it needs, as many as it enjoys at one particular website, as many as it thinks belongs together. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, sorry, yeah, no, no, actually this is an interesting idea. So I'll, I'll, let me try to summarize. Your idea is to build an aggregate model of multiple websites and how users tend to transition from website to website. Yeah. And so, um, and you can, you were suggesting a hierarchical HMM yeah. for that. And that's an interesting idea. We didn't, we haven't pushed on that. Um, uh, but it, 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 sure, it does seem like there's potential, say, to, to measure an exit probability for each page. Yeah. You know, do people go to IMDb, do a search, get a movie page, and then they're done, and then they exit? Or right. like exiting from a search page maybe is not a very common activity. Right. Um, and 
And where do they go from there? Do they go to Netflix, for example? Um, right. right. So uh, this is this looks. I have no idea. It might it might have a huge payoff. It might have no payoff, depending on how much the information is coming from the observations versus the. The transitions. I just want to comment that you, you did the hard stuff already, which is getting the feature construction and the off of that end stuff and getting good observation models. So, it, so I, I feel like you've done the hard work of like the, the awesome stuff first, which is really great. And I just like it could be you sort of cherry on top. Thank you. That's I, I appreciate the encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so you're saying you've gone this far. Why not just? Yeah, I feel like it could might, it might not be that much overhead to just sort of try. It, right. I'm not sure. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Again.